Ready? Okay. Welcome, everybody. Uh, tonight's program is a collaboration between Reversing Fall Sanctuary and the Good Life Center. Um, as you came in, you saw the kitchen table. There's a, uh, a guest book there. Please sign it. If you want to be on our email list, put your email next to your name, and uh, we'll keep you apprised of events that happen at the Good Life Center throughout the season. Uh, thank you all for coming. There's also a donation basket on the kitchen table, and, and tonight's proceeds will be split between the Good Life Center and the uh, upcoming climate change conference in Blue Hill. Uh, also on the table is refrigerator size uh, notices for the upcoming events at the Good Life Center. And uh, not surprisingly, several programs this summer are about climate change and the environment. We have a couple in August. Uh, we have a, a young activist from Rockland area, uh, Melissa Gates, and she'll be talking about ocean policy. And also in, um, in August, uh, Brooksville summer resident uh, Mimi Scheller, who is a uh, professor at Drexel University. And she'll be talking about uh, climate change and the refugee crisis around the world. Um, and her book, uh, Mobility Justice, is, uh, is getting quite, quite a lot of press lately. Uh, her new book is Island Futures, which is about uh, how climate change is affecting life on the islands from the coast of Maine all the way around the world. So um, that may be out by the time she comes in August. So, and then also in July, uh, we have um, Susan Han Shetterly and talking about coastal resources and reading from her book, Seaweed Chronicles. And we also have uh, Robin Alden and Ted Ames from Deer Isle who will be talking about the, uh, the coastal environment and resources. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, two, two authors who are writing books about homesteading. A young woman from uh, Monroe, who lives in Monroe. She's a homesteader, and she's <laughs> writing about the challenges of being a modern homesteader. And then in August, Margot Kelly um, is writing a book about, and she should be finished uh, by then, a book about the history of homesteading from the 1800s all the way to the present time. And obviously the nearings play a a large role in that. We also have a couple of uh, local organic farmers, the Volkhausens from Ellsworth, who will be coming and speaking about the challenges of organic gardening and farming. And uh, we have the Poet Laureate, Stuart Kessenbaum from Deer Isle, coming in uh, July uh, to talk about community, <laughs> poetry as community. And um, also, somebody from the Cobbs Cook Community uh, School up in Washington County, and he's going to talk about the challenges of rural education in Maine's poorest county. And he runs a fantastic program up there, and that should be really interesting. Um, and then to round off uh, the events of the summer, at the end of July, uh, Greg Jolie, who lives in Vermont, and he, he will be marking the 100th anniversary of Scott's trial for sedition. Um, he was jailed for writing a pamphlet uh, denouncing uh, corporate greed and war profiteering heading into uh, World War I. Uh, he defended himself in court, was, um, was acquitted. But uh, the title of his pamphlet was called The Great Madness. And uh, the, uh, the lead up to World War I and our involvement uh, is eerily and alarmingly similar to uh, what's going on with our government's response to uh, climate change and the denial that's going on in the government today. The limitation of civil rights and civil liberties, the suppression of the, uh, uh, of the press in relating to climate change. And um, Scott called it the plutocracy. And uh, we can have our own words for it these days. But he basically railed against that. And uh, the drumming up of patriotism back in uh, heading into World War I, where the majority of people wanted to keep us neutral, uh, they, uh, they raised the biggest military budget we ever had. Sounds familiar. Uh, he, uh, the president also picked on the Mexicans and called them criminals and rapists. Um, to drum up patriotism and fear amongst uh, the masses. So there's a lot of similarities going on in today's world. So I was thinking as I was driving over today, we probably the topic 
or the title of today's uh, uh, presentation could have been The Great Madness because it's <laughs> Great Madness Part. I was going to say Part part Infinity, but uh, Part Two. So, uh, so those are some of the events that are going on at the Good Life Center. And uh, this wouldn't have happened tonight without Tony Ferrara. So I'm going to introduce Tony and uh, thank you for making this happen. And the great madness subsidized by the fossil fuel industry. But uh, uh, I want to thank Warren and Allison uh, for this opportunity to talk to you about a, uh, a very important topic. Uh, if you're not familiar with how important it is, you should check the recent climate assessment that's come, come out of Australia in the last uh, few days. Uh, very, it's subtitled, The End of Civilization. Uh, and also thank uh, Rob Shetley of Americans Who Tell the Truth, which is part of this evening, uh, for his uh, allowing uh, this uh, information about uh, the, the conference. It, the name of it is the Climate Convergence Conference. And I'm going to just read just a little bit of the email that we sent to probably three or four dozen organizations asking them to uh, get on board to be in support of the conference. And it did have amazing success, uh, certainly followed up by personal communications. So uh, at some point it says, convergence is the key to the event. The convergence of the different generations, and I want to especially thank anyone who's attending under 30 years old today. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, the uh, convergence of the different generations. We'll have many youth, uh, you know, students, middle school, high school, and college students presenting their response to the, the dilemma that they find themselves in as regards climate. Uh, the convergence between the physical and social sciences. Uh, social sciences have been hard at work trying to answer the questions of how to overcome the, den the denial or how to gain control of the public narrative surrounding climate change. The convergence also among organizations willing to champion science and acknowledge that life on Earth is in jeopardy. Together we can explore the roots of science denial and change the nature of the public discourse regarding climate change. We may be surprised as well as heartened to find that our deepest private feelings about the state of our planet are widely shared by others, and by doing so, uh, empower each other to action. It is unfortunate that this convergence for the common good is ne necessitated by the convergence of climate catastrophes. With all the floods, forest fires, hurricanes, typhoons, and droughts of unprecedented magnitude, isn't it time to try science-based climate policy. So that's the message that, that is our message, science-based climate policy. So when we approach an organization and say, you know, tell them about our conference, what we're asking them is to be pro-science. And it's amazing uh, how many, uh, you know, people are, in fact, I've only come across one organization that said no, they can't uh, participate out of you know the three dozen or so. Uh, the conference will bring together dozens of organizations from a variety of sectors, environmental, conservation, business, education, food producers, health, social justice, marine, and spiritual. Together we will explore the current state of the Earth's health with acclaimed climatologist. 
uh, I was rereading the description today of some of the workshops that we have, and I mean, I'm impressed. <laughs> uh, and I participated in, uh, you know, in, 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 in writing. We have people like Jeremy Jackson. Uh, some of our workshops are, are organized uh, in different themes. And then the science themes is Jeremy Jackson, who's speaking about what's happening to the oceans. And he's a professor, professor of oceanography emeritus at Scripps Institution of Oceanography and senior scientist emeritus, is that the way you pronounce it, at the Smithsonian, Smithsonian Institute previously professor of ecology at Johns Hopkins University. And, I mean, the credentials of these people are just absolutely extraordinary, and they're willing to do this basically pro bono. We're just, uh, we're, there must be something to the fact that so many climatologists have decided to locate to this particular area uh, it may be rather on the safe side of the climate uh, change situation. Anyway, and I, and the same is true of Paul Majewski, uh, Ted Ames, and Robin Alden. Ted Ames is the uh, received the MacArthur Genius Fellowship, and is uh, also the uh, creator of the Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries, which is a great organization in Stonington. Uh, so, when we speak with, when we speak to young people, and we have met with high school students, uh, and and younger than high school, and we ask them, what you know, are your concerns, or how do you feel about the climate change? Uh, what they say, and maybe Rob will continue this, uh, uh, this you know, this point with your discussion with your base school, but. They say, well, I feel terribly anxious. I feel depressed. I'm worried. And I know my friends are worried that the young people who are coming into the information that the trajectory of our planet is not, you know, it's, it's bad. And that it does need uh, a lot of work to get it uh, moving in the right direction is rather frightening to uh, rather frightening to the young people. Uh, I should, well, I won't say that. That would, <laughs> that, that would, that would be a negative thing I would say, but no, I won't want to. Uh, so that particular dimension of, you know, how do you deal with climate-related or uh, psychological stress or angst uh, how do you deal with it? Well, we have uh, a, a Echo, he calls himself, or he has an institute, Echo Psychology, and it deals with how to uh, come to terms with the situation, both informationally and because of our very intimate, we all have a very inti intimate, nearly umbilical connection with the planet being part of, you know, the life here. So. We have uh, so many. Uh, I did, I should say, that I brought a good supply of uh, overview. These are brochures that provide an overview of the conference. But all of the information, including the long description of events and the workshop, is available on our website that's indicated on this brochure. Basically, reversing falls down the uh, all people, this is the, the end of it, uh, all people struggling against varieties of injustice, racism, poor education, violence, gender issues, pollution, poor health care, income in inequality, etc., etc., will be affected disproportionately by climate chaos. I think we know that by now, it's in the media. The necessity of recognizing the commonality of our causes in the face of climate change mirrors the necessity 
of recognizing our common humanity. There is no way forward without convergence, the convergence of the things that I mentioned before, and hopefully especially the convergence of the different generations. So anything else I should address on this particular? Tell them when it is. When is it? Uh, when is it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's in, a, <laughs> it's in a rather warm venue, George Stevens Academy, July 20th. All day. <laughs> All day. And uh, there are workshops. And once wow. you get into the, you know, the details of the uh, conference, I think you'll be uh, you know, encouraged to, uh, to, to participate. Why don't you pass around the... Brochures. Pass them around. Yeah, yeah, okay. Sure and just oh, in closing, I see this is a, a poster that we're trying to get up now. And on the left side, it says W E R U, 350 Maine, Trade Winds, Shaw Institute, Revision Energy, Healthy Arcadia, I should say also Healthy Peninsula, Good Life Center, uh, <clears throat> A Climate to Thrive, an incredible community organization based in Bar Harbor uh, who is helping us in a lot of ways. Uh, Veterans for Peace, we have Dud here, Morgan's Bay Zendo, Blue Hill Heritage Trust, College of the Atlantic, Bar Harbor Bank and Trust, Scholars Strategy Network, World Ocean Observatory, George Stevens Academy, Americans Who Tell the Truth, a law office in Bangor, Gross, Minsky and Mogul, Maine Psychological Association that required a lot of interaction to get their, uh, them on board. Sustainable Harvest International. Flo Reed, the director, is uh, one of the, and the Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries. This is only a uh, half of the organizations that are in support. So uh, I think it's very important for us to know that there's really a coming together of a meeting of the minds on this particular issue. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rob Shedley. I just want to say about Tony that this conference, he's been working on this for many months, and it would not be happening without him. I mean, he's just been uh, tireless in bringing all these people together, the whole vision of the convergence, not just of generations, but of all the different sectors of our community so that we're all looking at the same evidence and thinking the same way about how to protect this community and the larger community in the future is um, all been due to him so i mean thank you tony thank you. Yeah. i hope you all come um, john mccracken was a central piece of the uh, yes uh, john <laughs> I should have said that too. <laughs> but you haven't been serving cookies with your tea, so I'm, you're off my list now. <laughs> Anyways, um, there's, I mean, there's nobody in this room that needs to be convinced, I'm sure, about anything to do with climate change. Um, and I'm not going to be pushing anything in particular, um, science or otherwise. I'm just going to tell some stories about things I've been thinking about and things I've been doing. Um, but first, I want to say a little bit about Americans Who Tell the Truth Project because, and I suspect that most of you already know this, but I kind of made a little pact with myself that I would, would not stand up and talk without rehearsing a little bit of the history of this because, you know, when, when we look at what's happening today and, and how this country is being misgoverned, um, you know, this isn't new. Um, and in effect, uh, you, may, you might even want to say that what was done, you know, 18, 20 years ago actually had a, um, a worse impact, if that's possible, um, on this country and on the world. I mean, I'm speaking particularly about the run-up to the Iraq War and, and how that was managed, the way the press played a huge role in enabling that war. And it was because of all that that I started painting these portraits. Um, which was, began as a rather large and uh, ambitious therapy project for myself. I, I was not intending to um, be here talking or doing anything but every once in a while going down in the basement and seeing if they were okay. 
Instead, it became something else, and um, one of the things that's been the biggest part of it is now the educational work we do. You know, we run this project called the Samantha Smith Challenge in middle schools around the state, where we challenge you know, 12, 13-year-old kids to um, do something in the spirit of Samantha Smith. You know, choose an issue, research it, get involved with figuring out what can be done about it, get involved outside the school in actually doing something about it. And then at the end of the year, we bring all these kids together, sort of like a science fair, and they present um, the work they've done, talk, meet, meet each other. Uh, for the last few years, we've always brought some young activist from somewhere in the country uh, whose portrait I've recently painted. We unveil the portrait, and that person speaks to these kids about what they can be doing at the age of 12 and 13. And it's, it's a very exciting program. But I just want to, what I'm going to do is just tell some stories that, uh, about some things that happened this year in, um, at some of these schools. And um, one of the most exciting schools we work in is the Warsaw Middle School in Pittsfield, Maine. They, they have a set of terrific teachers. I mean, we run this program in the spring semester, and, but they start in September, and so they have the kids doing it all year round. And this year, it was all about climate. And what they had was 90 seventh graders split up in groups of two, three, four, five, and each group took a different aspect of something to do with climate. So there were groups looking at habitat destruction, at plastics in the ocean, sea level rise, you know, what CO2 levels do to the atmosphere, um, you know, just on and on and on. Everything, that, everything you can think of, there was a group doing something about it, and they did uh, 17 different uh, sort of public service video an, uh, announcements uh, that were, actually I went to, to Pittsfield a few weeks ago to see all of them projected in a movie theater at once with all the kids and the parents. And that's another thing that teachers do, which is so exciting is they make sure the whole community gets involved with what these kids are learning. What you see then is these kids become experts in these fields. I mean, they don't become Jeremy Jackson, but they learn an enormous amount. They learn far more than their parents know. And many of these kids come from families of um, people who are you know, climate deniers. Uh, and these kids learn you know, all this stuff about the climate. And in effect, they then become the teachers of the whole community, which is what this is all about, really, for us, is getting young people so informed and so activated and so passionate about the issues that they become the teachers. And it's successful. They love being the teachers. I mean, you ever said, I met a 12-year-old who didn't like being a teacher? Um, so, but um, that was one of the, um, the, one of the, I guess one of the most interesting things about their, these kids and their the videos they made and, the, and the, the science they learned was, you know, one sort of how urgent and passionate they were about the importance of all this, and you all know this. But it's great to see that passion and urgency reflected back from 12-year-olds. And it's also kind of overwhelming. And I'll get, come back to that in a little bit. So that's one school. I want to just mention, and, and Tony mentioned this, but it has to do with something he was talking about, about the, the importance of the public narrative and changing that narrative. We did a program in the Bay School where we just had um, a bunch of kids, there were six girls, who wanted to sit down and talk about climate. And I brought in um, a bunch of portraits that included Kelsey Giuliani from the, um, the Our Children's Trust lawsuit, uh, Tim to Christopher. I don't know if I had Naomi Klein. I had a, had a whole group of, of climate portraits, including the portrait of Samantha Smith herself. And the first thing we did was just went around the room, and each kid said something about what they knew about where we were in regard to climate. And they knew everything, just like the kids in Warsaw. I mean, um, without even doing any homework about it, they, they could tell you all about what's happening in the oceans and habitat destruction, everything. And I said, at the end of that, I said, okay, that's great. You know, I, I'm, I'm impressed with what you know. And I said, how do you feel? And then every one of them said, terrified. Terrified. Um, 
I mean, there's a, when that happens, when you've got a bunch of middle school kids being terrified and there isn't anything really being done about it. Uh, I asked if there were, if the, the, parent, I mean, the teachers were teaching to climate change on a regular basis. The answer was no, which really surprised me. And I said, well, this is something you can do as kids, is lobby for more teaching around this subject. So then what I did then was just tell them a bunch of stories about people who had also started in places of being anxious uh, and fearful, maybe even terrified, uh, at least very angry, and done something. And you know, the most uh, important one of those was probably Samantha Smith, who had nothing to do with climate. I mean, she knew nothing about climate change, but she was you know, a 12-year-old, 11-year-old peace activist who started in this place of total fear that the world was going to be blown up and ended up you know, having a voice around the world about how to make peace in the world. And after I told all these stories, um, and there were, a lot of them focused on what young people had done, and at the end I said, well, how do you feel now? And every one of the girls said, inspire, which doesn't speak, you know, it's not about, you know, what I was doing, it is, but it's about this power of story and telling stories that show you that uh, people can engage these issues, um, it can make a difference, and, um, you know, things can be done. And it all, you know, particularly involves just making that first step. I mean, the, the thing with Samantha Smith, you know, she wrote a letter never expected anything else to happen, you know. She wrote a letter to Yuri Andropov, the new premier of the Soviet Union. And then a whole series of cascading events happened. You never know what's going to happen when you actually take the first step, you know. You've got to do something. And everything you do gives you an opportunity to do something else. And she kept following that up, you know, like this and this and this. And she went, this little, you know, scared little kid was now teaching adults all around the world how to think differently about peace in the world. Um, those kinds of stories that are just a, you know, an everyday person can do um, are extremely helpful when we're talking about, and well, we're feeling overwhelmed uh, about how big this issue is and how impotent we often feel about what we can do about it. Um, we can always be doing something. And it doesn't need to be grandiose. Just you know, one thing, one step at a time, all of us doing something. Um, at the Leonard Middle School in Old Town, they, the kids were all divided up. And, and in the Samantha Smith Challenge, the kids don't do just environmental stuff. I mean, there's some kids are working on issues around teen suicide, and some are working around the opioid crisis, and you know, just on and on and on. They, they, they choose their own thing that they're interested in. Um, what the, uh, there was a group there, though, that this was, well, let's just say, every year, they're kids doing um, issues that surprised me, the things I hadn't even thought of. This year, there were five, uh, a group of five seventh graders who were uh, passionate about terraforming. Do you know what I'm talking about? I didn't know what they were talking about. You know, this is colonizing other planets. Um, this is what Elon Musk is concerned about and thinking of doing, you know, using his money to make it possible. And the reason they were doing this, is, as you probably already guessed, was because they think that, uh, you know, this place is doomed. And what we ought to be thinking about is how to live on Mars. I was just reading about it today. You know, one of the ways that they're talking about making Mars habitable is to fill the atmosphere with greenhouse gases. I mean, it's a little ironic, right? Uh, but, um, I mean, and this is, you know, something that's probably um, way, way beyond. But these kids were actually hoping that this was all going to be solved pretty soon. And I said, well, geez, how many, how many of you think you're going to be able to go? You know, how many is, people as Elon Musk and, you know, Bill Gates, whoever, you know, builds a ship and goes there, how many people are they going to take? Oh, they said millions. Well, millions of us will get away. <laughs> in, um, it just speaks to um, what kids are going through, you know, how desperate they are, how well they're reading the signs of how serious the problem is, and where they're putting their hope. You know, these weren't dumb kids. Uh, 
So um, then I also want to, this, this is another little anecdote. I was invited in, um, I think it was back in February, to unveil a portrait in Brooklyn, New York, in a very fancy hotel where a group of philanthropists was having a big meeting. Um, and it, what they were there to talk about was not to whom they give their money. I mean, all of them give money to social causes, environmental causes. But they were there to talk with each other about how best to invest their money um, so that they have plenty of money to give away. And they were also being scolded by some of the other philanthropists for giving money to environmental causes at the same time that they're heavily invested still in fossil fuels and things like that, which a lot of them are. But anyway, I was there to unveil this portrait of a man named Reverend Lennox Yearwood, who I just painted. I don't know if any of you know who he is. He's a, a black activist, a minister from the inner city, lives in uh, Washington now, um, originally from Chicago, I think. He started something called the Hip Hop Caucus. And the idea was to get inner city kids, especially kids of color, interested in environmental and climate issues and use the, the method of hip hop to, to get to them. He, he's an amazing guy. If you don't, if you've never heard of him, uh, go on YouTube and look up Re Le Reverend Lennox Yearwood and, and, uh, you know, and see him talk, listen, you know, read about his programs. I was doing an event in, in uh, Vermont with Bill McKibben and McKibben said, you know, you ought to paint Lennox Yearwood. Anyway, so there I was. So I painted Lennox Yearwood, and, but I, I brought the portrait to unveil in front of this group of philanthropists, one of the, the philanthropic organizations called um, the Wallace Global Fund that, invite, that, that helps to fund uh, Hip Hop Caucus, asked me to come and unveil it to, to show how cool, you know, well, anyway, whatever. It, it, was, it was all supposed to... Uh, enhance the, the image of, of the uh, Hip Hop Caucus. Before it started, this is what I want to tell you, there were a bunch of people in the, they had a green room in the back where all the speakers were. And in that room were Lennox Yearwood and a couple of assistants. Amy Goodman from Democracy Now! was in there with an assistant or two. Uh, this woman, Ellen Dorsey from the Global uh, Climate Fund, the Global Fund was there. And, uh, and then myself. And I came in kind of late, and they were all already talking about all the stuff they were going to do to try to uh, engage all these big philanthropists and get them excited about their, their projects around the environment. And so they, you know, everybody was saying what they're doing and, and how they're doing it and all this stuff, and it was a lot of energy. And all of a sudden, it got real quiet. And then somebody, and I think it may have been Yearwood himself, but I'm not sure, somebody said, you know, but the truth is we're fucked. <laughs> I just, that was really interesting. I mean, um, you know, and I've run against, up against that a lot, you know, with people who are leaders in these movements. You know, how scared they are that they're not doing enough, that none of us is doing enough, that even if we're doing everything we can, it's too late, you know? And um, that doesn't mean at all, you know, we should not double our efforts, triple our efforts, you know, all the time. Uh, we've got to. But there, the, the thing, the reason I bring that up is because it, that's the reality of how I think an awful lot of people feel, even the ones who are doing the most, that they're really frightened about how far this has gone and uh, how... I don't know, criminal, you know, has been uh, the delay, the denial, the purposeful obfuscation of what's wrong and, and what could have been done about it much sooner. Um, some of you may have watched last week on the same theme, but on the, the hopeful side, the uh, rehearing of the uh, Our Children's Trust suit uh, on June 4th. This was, uh, the suit has been put on stay. This is the group of 21 young people who sued the U.S. government, uh, basically trying to do what uh, our climate conference is doing, is have it legally um, insistent now that the, the United States act on the basis of science in regard to climate. And this case had gone forward, and then and the government tried very hard to block it again and again and again. And 
and then a, a stay was put on it several months ago, and this was a hearing to lift the stay. You can watch it on, on YouTube. The hearing only lasted like, I don't know, one hour. was it an hour? It didn't even seem like an hour. It was, um, but it, 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 was, it went by pretty quickly. There were some interesting points in it that I think was, it seemed to me that it kind of boiled down to, to two arguments. The judges, the three-judge panel, was more than allowing the lawyers from either side to talk were inter interrupting them constantly, you know, demanding explanations of you know, what they were saying and why they were saying it. And, and so it was, had this kind of herky-jerky feely to it. But, I mean, the lawyers for the, for the kids, for the Juliana versus U.S. case, uh, the Our Children's Trust, you know, were saying, you know, they're explaining the emergency we're in, and we've got to act, we've got to do something, and, you know, this case has got to go forward. The judges were saying, well, what's the precedent? You know, what precedents, you know, if we're going to pass this on to the Supreme Court, you know, what laws are we going to, or cases are we going to use as precedent? And, you know, they, it, it seemed kind of odd that these <coughs> very intelligent judges couldn't see that the situation we're in, we're in now is unprecedented. There really isn't a precedent, you know, for, there isn't a case like this. You know, they were, they're saying we want to base what we're going to, our decision on something that's already been done. Well, nothing's been done like this. And the lawyers for the government uh, were trying a delaying tactic, which was just appalling. I mean, what they were saying was, you know, you shouldn't be suing the government. You should be going back and basically making all these precedents. You should be, you know, suing corporations, suing the EPA, suing the Fish and Wildlife, you know, suing some congressman who didn't, you know, start all these things, these little cases. You know, this obviously take years and years and years and years to build up these precedents and then come back. And that was the, that was the, the means that the government was using to finally to try to stop this case once more. Um, I'm not sure how soon, you know, the judges are going to come down with a decision. Um, it was an odd thing to watch um, and, and, and to see that, I mean, I've, I've often felt that this case could literally be a hinge on our future, what happens in this case with these 21 kids. Um, and, you know, if it gets blocked because of this kind of curious language of, well, we don't have a precedent uh, to proceed on, uh, that would be uh, tragic at this point. But it's um, the organization, by the way, if you're interested in, if you don't know about our Children's Trust and the work they do and the way they've supported these kids in the suit, uh, look it up. It's a terrific website with enormous information about this case and the, and the history of the public trust doctrine, which they're basing the case on. You know, the idea that any government's first responsibility is to protect the environment for the next generation and generation and generation. I want to speak a little bit, I was just um, kind of musing today about the Greta Thunberg. I, is there anybody here who doesn't know who I'm talking about? Uh, I think um, that in a way that she is um, an expression of what we might say that has been drawn out or projected out of a, a collective unconscious, that it seems at times like this, Someone shows up, and it's a child usually, it has to be a child, who can speak like that to adults, who can discipline adults, can explain to adults what's wrong with everything they've done, and adults will listen and applaud that child for what is being said. It's a very curious thing that um, how powerful this girl is. I mean, and it's also curious that, um, and I think is part of the strange archetype that is involved in a, in a kid, this sort of child saint who speaks like that uh, without authority, is that, um, you know, she's, you know, in, in this case, she, we're told that she has Asperger's. Um, she is somehow 
outside the, you know, she's on the spectrum. She's on the, uh, outside the range of, uh, of uh, normal kids, which is probably something really important about who she is. And, and she says it herself, that it, it makes her see the world in a Manichaean fashion. You know, everything's black and white. Well, this is a black and white issue, really. Um, and, you know, that, that uh, you know, when you watch those videos of her speaking to the European Parliament or, you know, those different august bodies of intelligent and, and successful and, uh, people of an age of most of us in this room. And, you know, the power with, and clarity with which she speaks and speaking with that particular style, it's, it's like being spoken to by the Lorax. You know, and she is that kind of being that is slightly, has that kind of authority that's outside, um, you know, normal adult authority, and but then is enhanced because of that. It's a, uh, you know, I mean, I was thinking if it, well, you know, Pope Francis doesn't have that authority. He speaks, you know, he says incredible things about the environment and every stuff, but, you know, people you know, listen and say it's important and then dismiss it. Uh, it doesn't inspire a whole lot of other action. Um, and there are a lot of other people, um, many of whom I've painted, who speak about these issues with deeper knowledge about them than, than Greta Thunberg. But why is it that she has that extraordinary uh, access and extraordinary authority? You know, part of it has to do with um, you know, the simplicity of her initial actions, where she sits with a sign and refuses to go to school and calls out the parliament. But, you know, there are a lot of nutcases who sit with signs under a bridge and uh, nobody pays any attention, you know. Um, it's, um, I mentioned Samantha Smith before. Samantha was, had a piece of that kind of authority as an 11-year-old. Um, Anne Frank had a piece of that authority, who, you know, through her, through her writing, humanized and uh, personalized, you know, the nature of that kind of terrible oppression of the, the Holocaust. Uh, Greta Thunberg has a piece of that, uh, and maybe the most important one of our time, where, you know, she she speaks with that child's clarity and people listen. I mean, you can't dismiss it, you know, the way you can dismiss so many people, um, you know, in the sense of, well, it's partisan or, you know, it's, um, you know, do you know, do you realize who, who, uh, who their funders are, you know, and so you can develop some sort of cynicism about the nature of the message. You know, there are lots of ways to dismiss what, what important, um, the important messages of a lot of people. In a, in a curious way, she both is the messenger and she creates the audience for her message because of her own behavior. I don't, um, you know, I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like that happen, uh, um, you know, at this, at, well, certainly not at this moment. I mean, you think of all the people like, you know, Wendell Berry, Naomi Klein, you know, people like that who, you know, carry an enormous amount of knowledge about these issues and are dismissed in a way that you can't dismiss a 15-year-old girl. Um, and adults who would easily dismiss them in one way or another or ask them to be, uh, find some way to compromise their points of view or whatever it is, stand up and applaud this kid who doesn't compromise at all. It's interesting. Um, I want to in just, if people want to, I'd love to hear other people's ideas about that. But I want to bring it back to something that was said about um, Americans Who Tell the Truth when I had just started. One of the first shows I had was over in, in Bar Harbor at Real Pizza. And it was uh, Martin Luther King Day, and it might have been, I don't know, 2004 or five. I, the, the total collection of portraits was, I think, 20 at that time. And um, they, they were showing a film about apartheid, and I was asked to speak afterwards about King, and then about, uh, there was a reception. And this woman came up to me with her seven-year-old daughter. His name was Iris. 
And she said, uh, the mother said, I brought Iris here to see these, all these paintings the other day, and we walked around, we read the quotes, and then she said, when Iris said something that you might want to know, and she handed me this little yellow post-it, which is up on the wall in my studio still, um, and said, here's what Iris said. And Iris was you know, standing right there, and it said, I'm so excited. I think he remembers everything the children know. <laughs> I have trouble remembering anything these days, but uh, there was uh, what was going on there was something about what informs Greta Thunberg. There is a sense that, that she has some prophetic and, and deep knowledge uh, because of her intuitive relationship to her feelings and to this time that, um, that she speaks out of. And that's what this little girl Iris was feeling coming out of the paintings was that kind of um, deep certainty. Not so much about the rightness of the words that were on them, but the importance of the actions. You know, the importance of having the moral courage to act for justice, you know, to act with compassion, to act for other people. And that's where Greta is, and that's where this little girl, that's what this little girl Iris was reading. Um, I want to say uh, something else about climate, which isn't said anywhere near enough. And I'm uh, Dud is sitting right here. Dud Hendrick. Um, I don't know. I assume a lot of you know him. Um, he and I were six weeks ago were arrested at Bath Ironworks, um, trying to um, protest the uh, launching of this huge new battleship called the LBJ. I mean. I mean, just think about that. I mean, how did, how did LBJ, you know, get escalate, you know, the Iraq, I mean, the, the Vietnam War? You know, he promoted a lie about an American ship being attacked, you know, by North Vietnamese gunboats and used that Gulf of Tonkin incident, incident uh, to escalate a war that never should have been fought. And so here the Navy names, you know, a big boat after him. Uh, you know, a stealth destroyer, it's unbelievable, it costs six, seven billion dollars, billion dollars. And then, by the way, this is amusing, you know, for after the event fact, is most of the ship doesn't work after seven billion dollars. The guidance system, the weapon systems, none of it works. They're actually going to use it as a junkyard to supply the two other ones that they built first that also don't work. So that $7 billion is going to be parts for these other boats. And then they say eventually they'll, they'll uh, fix it up. But of course, I doubt that'll ever happen. Just think about what's going on here. Um, but that was only part. What we were really doing there, besides protesting this launching of a ship we don't need, was the connection between climate and militarism. You know, the Pentagon, the American military, has the biggest single entity footprint of anything in the world in terms of carbon emissions. The biggest. I mean, it's just an enormous amount. I mean, we have this empire that has over 800 bases, you know, all over the world. It runs on oil. It wastes an enormous amount of oil. And it wants to control the world's oil supply so it never runs out. You know, it's not about this to uh, convert to um, you know, tanks run on batteries. This is a huge problem. Uh, you know, m there are very few politicians, even progressive politicians, and you can probably count them on uh, maybe two fingers, maybe one, you know, who are actually willing to raise this issue because they're terrified of talking about anything that, that uh, demeans the U.S. military and its mission in the world. We can't solve this problem. We can't do this thing about climate change and make any headway if we don't deal with the military. You know, the U.S. military has got to be brought under control and brought back. I mean, it's just... Um, 
it's astounding, you know, what's being done and we can't talk about it. Um, but it needs to be talked about. There's another ship being launched on June 22nd and some of us will be there again to uh, probably get arrested. And um, join us, you know, come and just join the protests uh, down at Bath Ironworks. You don't have to get arrested. Uh, but just be there. I mean, this is the thing that's going on now, though, is a lot worse than just what I just said. Because, you know, a hundred years ago, Emma Goldman said um, the greatest bulwark of capitalism is militarism. And, you know, what she's suggesting there is that, you know, the, in order for capitalism to have its resources and to find its markets and its cheap labor and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It uses the military. Well, this is a long history of this country doing that, you know, all over the world. We've gotten to this point now where actually capitalism and militarism are synonymous. They're the same thing. You know, it's probably the biggest business in the country is the manufacture of weapons which means also the manufacture of war. The use of fear and insecurity to create more war, more weapons. This is a huge, huge business. I mean, what we were protesting, you know, wasn't just, you know, a ship we don't need. You know, it was a ship we don't need being made for profit that means there's going to be another one like it made very soon. It's the same with the wars. The wars are being fought for profit not for our security. As a matter of fact, it increases our insecurity. Every one of these increases our insecurity and our standing in the world and the legitimacy of our own values and everything else. This is a huge, huge issue and we've got to talk about it because we can't solve you know, the, the, you know, the climate problem. We can't solve the funding for anything, for education, infrastructure, health care, you know, on and on and on, all the things that actually a decent society would want to fund. We can't adequately because of where all the money's going. You know, nearly 60% of our discretionary funds go to our military and for themselves to perpetuate more military. This is a huge thing. We've got to deal with it in terms of climate. Um, I've told Tony I won't make a big deal out of this at this conference. <laughs> Don't want to chase everybody out the door. But it's the elephant, you know, it's the elephant in the room. And we've got to talk about it at, at some levels. Um, so, um, what do I, is there anything else I want to say here? Um, oh, I, I just want to make a little comment about sort of um, the, the weirdness of apocalyptic thinking. Um, you know, which at this moment, you know, when you see kids who are thinking they better get off the planet and go live on Mars, um, that that's a really sane and, and healthy idea. Uh, that's certainly apocalyptic thinking and, and thinking that is, you know, being promoted in, in some places. But it's, it's, it seems interesting to me that, you know, we've, we've lived in a society now that has... Um, especially our entertainment industry, has promoted apocalyptic thinking for a long, long time. Um, and I wonder about the effect of that on people. I mean, but because of what it does is, I mean, you, it, it lets you indulge in the kind of titillation of almost being blown away, totally, uh, while you're eating popcorn for two hours, and then come back and step outside, and there's the traffic and people, and didn't ha really happen. And we get this idea that somehow this climate crisis, I think for a lot of people, is being approached almost like that. You know, We have indulged unreality and been entertained by unreality for so long that when the reality comes, uh, we really don't know how to handle it, uh, except to treat it like unreality. And um, you know, we've... One of the things that, of course, will happen at this conference is to treat, is talk with some really serious reality about what's really going on, um, how, you know, and, and then particularly, and most important then, is what each one of us can be doing 
uh, in response to that because there is no, um, and we shouldn't even indulge in any ideas about hope unless we're actually willing to commit ourselves to doing something. Um, because, you know, that it's a, hope is either why, you know, it can be just a ridiculous and, and uh, you know, sentimental idea if it isn't come directly out of something you're doing in particular. And if we want to give to our children, our grandchildren, our next generations uh, a sense of hopefulness, you know, it's got to be through the things we do. And that's why I think this, you know, this conference that Tony and Joan put together is so important because it, at the end of it, there's all this, the things to do. And uh, those are the, it's in the doing that we find community, we find joy, we find meaning, uh, and then we have some hope. So anyway, thank you. I'd love to have some conversation about some of those ideas. Someone saw me at Ames Cove earlier today and invited me here. And I wonder, <laughs> thank you very much for inviting me here. Thank you, Brad Jeffers. Um, I just moved here from Ithaca. I just graduated from Ithaca College. And i am been hired, thank you, for the summer to be the gardener at Hiram Blake's. Um, and while at Ithaca, my friends and I launched the Sunrise Movement Hub in Ithaca. The Sunrise... The Sunrise Movement is a climate justice, climate action movement um, led primarily spearheaded by people younger than 30. And um, I'm new in this community and I'll be here through October and maybe later, but I'm very happy to have appeared here tonight and to see you all here. And um, if you need a hand, I would love, uh, or if anyone wants to talk, I would love to, to discuss more what members of, of this community that are younger than 30 can do and how those of us who stand there with them at this time in life can bridge gaps or, or hold meaningful conversations. You're hired. Great. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Chris Barnes. Chris, yes. nice Chris, to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Thank you. you should know that one of the Green New Deal that one of the, well, the keynote speaker at the conference is Chloe Maxman, and she's a representative cool. uh, who is uh, the spearheading the main Green New Deal situation. Fantastic. And uh, so, you know, she could give she's us a nice 26. overview. 26. Great. Of, uh, of awesome. the situation. Yeah. So, Chris, <laughs> we'll work with you. <laughs> what, what, did, what did you think? What were your reactions to Rob's remarks? <laughs> Terrified, as he says. Uh, no, that it, no, what was it? My reaction. Did you learn anything? To... Here uh, tonight, my reaction was that discussing the terror that not only young people feel, but that all of us feel, is the most important thing that we can be doing right now. Because although there is a fine line between pessimism and optimism, the courage in between is for us all to be willing to decide that. Catastrophe will not be averted. Catastrophe is occurring. Many will suffer. And yet, it is only doubling and tripling our efforts that will pull us through into a future that is unforeseen but bright and very, very strong. And, yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's very important to listen to young people say that they're scared. And... For older folks to also get in touch with your own fear, because inside of our fear is a power that we don't quite understand yet. It's a power to understand what's coming. And uh, to know that as we take steps and we see the rollout and the impact of this catastrophe, and we continue to work through it still, we will overcome. We will come together and be stronger. Um, and it's, it's unforeseen, but we feel it. And we have, we need to sit there with that. And we need to feel that. We need to work with it. So, great, thank you. Yeah, but thank you do, too. Do you know Sandra Steingraber? She's a professor. I had several classes. Yeah, with. And I painted her portrait. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, cool. 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 Yeah. Thank Glad you. you're here. Are you planning to stay in this community? 
Or are you yeah. just passing through? I don't know. I mean, I've been here 10 days, so <laughs> it's, a, it's, a new, it's a new thing. <laughs> well, I hope you're here on July 20th. Yeah, I will be. Okay, great. Yeah. You'll be working. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. It, it seems like Wall Street, meaning our economy, uh, works against everything we're talking about here tonight. Do, do you see uh, the economy bending toward this movement as a way to keep itself alive at all, or is that uh, is that the main problem? And uh, everybody who works in Wall Street is, is uh, just going to go down the tubes with everyone else that's scared to death. And uh, I'm not sure what I'm getting at. I just feel that the economy, as it has been forever, is our basic problem. Profit means more today than any climate catastrophe. Right. At the moment. Yeah, it still does. Well, I think you're. I mean, you're, you're putting. You know, by saying that, you're focusing on maybe the essential problem. And that is what I said earlier about the denial of reality. You know, our whole economy has been built on the denial of reality of the place we live in and its economy. The natural world, you know, has an economy, right? You know, it is not an economy based on expansion, expanding profits, stock options, and, and profit forever. You know, it, it isn't. You know, we have, if we're going to live on this planet, we have to live by the planet's laws. We can't build an economy that's completely opposite to the place we live and the laws of the place we live in and expect to be able to live here. Um, if we're going to change this economy, and this is, of course, what is so important about the Green New Deal. It isn't just you know, doing everything with solar and wind. It's figuring out how to make you know, that transition from, you know, a, to a... a reality-based economy that works you know, with the environment, that is sustainable, that doesn't overuse its resources and, and, and toxify everything while it does it. Um, this quote here speaks directly to that, what you were just saying. This is Naomi Klein. You know. uh, are you familiar with her? And maybe read some of them. Yeah. And this, she says, our economy is at war with many forms of life on Earth, including human life. What the climate needs to avoid collapse is a contra contraction in humanity's use of resources. What our economic model demands to avoid collapse is unfettered expansion. Only one of these sets of rules can be changed, and it's not the laws of nature. You know, and that seems to be what you're asking about. We've got to, um, you know, one of the, the things that's so important about the Green New Deal is the way it looks at. Uh, finding a way to make those transitions, to build jobs that are sustainable, healthy jobs while people are going through those changes so that people aren't just dumped, you know, even Wall Street people. I mean, we're not saying that any, anybody's expendable. But we're going to need everybody's help. And so, you know, how, you know, how we change that mindset of the people in power who are now in power and control of um, the finances of power is a huge issue because that's you know, where the, the, the changing of the narrative is so important. Oh, oh. Oh, can I just say, I'm sorry. You can say anything you want. Yeah. Uh, I'm never finished. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I just came across the, a little while ago, quotation, it's easier for most people to imagine the end of the world rather than the end of capitalism. <laughs> and it, you know, it, it's so, uh, and, and the kind of, and everyone in this area is talking about systemic change, incremental change, forget it, you know, it's got to be massive change and so forth. And one of the, uh, there's an area called transactional resilience, and it, it deals with the changes that have to be made for such radical changes to take place. And it involves... Uh, like uh, basic changes as who you are in terms of your own identity, uh, you know, like not only an an ego identity, but nearly a trans. They use the word transpersonal. In other words, a, nearly a cosmic, uh, you know, consciousness that and so, et cetera, You know, stuff like that. So there's a lot of uh, ideas well, as, about that. As so, uh, Chris said so well. I mean, these changes are happening, and they're already happening catastrophically. And it's, you know, 
it's not going to be easy. No. A lot of, there's going to be a lot of pain, yeah, however we go. It seems to be easier than not doing it at some point. So that oh, some, absolutely. Someone yeah, who, whose whole life is uh, yeah. built on trading money back and forth and making a cent here and there can see that there's a better way. And it's worse to keep on doing what they're doing. Yeah. Right. I just like to say that we have a volunteer sheet to help. We have no idea we're, whether we're going to have 75 people, 150 people, or 300 people at this conference. And trying to plan for this is a little difficult. But if you're interested, I know that there are some of you here that have signed up to volunteer. Um, it's going to be an all-day conference. Friday evening we're going to set things up and we're going to see what happens and who comes in. So it wouldn't be a lot of work, but we need ushers, we need people to uh, guide the parking lot uh, to where they're going to be in, in George Stevens. And uh, if you'd like to help, and the whole idea of what we're trying to do is to, once people come and hear what's being presented and talk and discuss, that maybe then we can have people decide they want to break into action groups around the peninsula that we can get involved in. And if you're into the agricultural part of it or the waste management or water or energy, um, this is a way to try to activate more of us to do a lot of what MDI has uh, successfully done. And so we are not alone. One person isn't going to be able to fix it. Um, but together, we can definitely make a move. So if you want to sign up, Here's your sheet. <laughs> I'll pass it around. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, thank you for being here. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Oh, hey. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that. I've done that. Stick around for some popcorn and tea in the kitchen. Christmas to have you in the neighborhood. Too bad.